looking at Jesus as the Son of God. We have a whole series on the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, and now we've been looking at Jesus, the Son of God. And the question I want us to consider tonight is, is simple, but it's important. Why is it necessary to believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Acts chapter 8, and look at verse 26, if you would. Pretty far into the chapter, verse 26. In Acts chapter 8, Philip had been up in uh, Samaria, a little bit northwest of Jerusalem, and uh, been preaching, been having a wonderful time. Things are going great. God is working. People are putting their faith in the Lord. Lives are being changed. Souls are being saved. It's a great time. So you'd think in the middle of that, God would say, well, just keep going. But look what happened, verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now, that's, that's pretty amazing. Philip gets up. He's been there preaching, teaching. Lots of good things are happening. Lots of response. And the Lord says, I want you to go somewhere else. And he got something else for you to do. And notice the first words of verse 27, then we'll pray. It says, and he arose and went. The Lord told him to go, he went. He obeyed the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Speak to us through this evening. Give us the understanding that we need and touch our hearts according to our individual needs as only you know what those are. Lord, as always, we pray that anyone who hasn't already placed their faith and trust in you would in this hour. And those who have, would be strengthened in their faith. Lord, we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So in Acts chapter 8, we have a series of stories. This one that we're looking at is the second to the last story in the chapter. The, the very last one is quite short. But this one tells about a man from Ethiopia, and it tells us how that man came to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, we already looked at verse 26. For the angel of the Lord came to Philip and said, I want you to leave Samaria and go down south unto the way that goeth toward, down toward, I'm sorry, from Jerusalem uh, unto Gaza, which is desert. It is desert. Uh, you may have heard of the Gaza Strip. It's, it's been quite controversial. It, it kind of is the borderline between Israel and, and the Palestinian territory today. And it wasn't like that in those days. It was all under Roman control at that time. But that's where Philip was told to go. And the wonderful part about it in verse 27, he arose and went. He was an obedient servant of the Lord. And the angels told him to go. And Philip says, if the Lord wants me to go, I'll go. I'm going to do the Lord's business. I'm going to do what he tells me to do. Verse 27 again, and he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, a, a great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Now that one verse tells us a great deal about this man. Number one, he's a man from Ethiopia. All right? That's quite a bit south of Israel. But he's a man from Ethiopia. He's a man of great authority. He has a high position. His authority came from Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. Well, what was his job? Well, it tells us he was a royal treasurer. Yes, he was a man of great authority. He was a royal treasurer. He controlled the finances of the kingdom of Ethiopia. But he had come to Jerusalem. Now, why did he come to Jerusalem? Well, it tells us he came to worship. Well, who or what did he come to worship? The one true God. And so evidently he had gone to the temple in Jerusalem. He had gone there to worship. And now he was on his way back home. He was on his way to Ethiopia again. And he had sought God. And we talked in Sunday school hour this morning. How about if anybody truly wants to know God, anybody truly in their heart wants to seek God, they will. They'll find him. God will make himself 
available to him. And that's the situation we see here. This man went to Jerusalem seeking God. Now, he hasn't quite come to know what he wanted to know. But he was seeking, and you know, God wasn't about to turn him away. So look at verse 28. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah, or Isaiah the prophet. Now the book of Isaiah is an Old Testament book, first of the major writing prophets. 66 chapters long, it's the longest of the major writing prophets. And this man's there reading Isaiah. Now, if you have to understand that day, he wasn't reading it like we would read it today in, in book form, and he certainly wasn't reading it on a Kindle or anything like that. But he had a scroll. He would have had a large scroll rolled out as he stood in his chariot, and he's taking a look at it. And he's reading Isaiah. Now, I think this next part is, is tremendous. Remember, the angel told Philip to go, and he arose and went. He went right away. He didn't hesitate. Verse 29, then the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, said unto Philip, go near, join thyself to this chariot. So the Holy Spirit told Philip to go, and he told him to, to get over and, and join the fellow who's in the chariot. And I want you to notice what happened. Verse 30, and Philip leisurely strolled over there. Is that what it says? No, it says, this Philip ran. Holy Spirit says, I want you to go talk to that man in that chariot. And Philip ran. What an obedient servant. What an obedient man. He's preaching up in Samaria. Angel says, Lord wants you to go down to Gaza. Okay, I'm going. Gets down to Gaza. Lord says, go talk to that man. He runs. He is eager to do what the Lord wants him to do. Now, you and I probably don't have such direct communication is that. That doesn't mean that God isn't speaking to us. It doesn't mean that there aren't things that he wants us to do. And so he gets to the man, 30 again, and Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. Now he must have been reading out loud. And so Philip said to him, understand this, I what now read this. Do you understand what you're reading? Notice 31. And he said, how can I, except some man should guide me? Apparently, he could read the language. I don't know which language he was reading in. Uh, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but at that period of time, there was a Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, and it was in wide use in Israel at that time. And I suspect that may have been what he was reading. Whether he was reading in Hebrew or Greek, it wasn't Ethiopian. And by the way, the Ethiopian language is quite different. I have uh, in my possession an Ethiopian Bible. We used to have a family from Ethiopia here in the church, and they gave me an Ethiopian Bible. I cannot read a word of it. I can't tell you where's Genesis and where's Revelation. I can't read a word of it. It's a completely different language. So he was reading from Hebrew or Greek, but it's not surprising. A man of his possession, the uh, position, I meant to say, or the royal treasure, was no doubt an educated man. But he doesn't understand what he's reading. And so, verse 31 again, he said, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. And Philip listens to what he read, and we're about to be told what he read. Now, as I told you, he's reading from a scroll. And that scroll, whether it was in Hebrew or Greek, didn't have chapter and verse divisions like we have today. I, I'm telling you, go to, to verse 31, verse 32, and it makes things easier to find that way. But those were added much later. When he read that scroll, uh, he just read the scroll, and it was written straight through. In column, yes, but straight through. And so, as he reads, he's reading from what we know today, or what we would call Isaiah chapter 53. Now, Isaiah chapter 53 prophesies the crucifixion of Jesus. And the important thing to understand about this chapter prophesying the crucifixion of Jesus is it was written 700 years before Jesus came. 
Sometimes the world needs the Christian to take a Bible and explain to them Jesus. Sometimes the world needs you and I to take a Bible and explain to them Jesus. Because the world needs Jesus. And the world doesn't understand. And how can they understand without someone to guide them through the fact that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture? So look again at verse 31. He said, how can I understand? Except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the Scripture which he read was this. And here begins the words of Isaiah. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before a shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? In 34, the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this of himself or some other man? Who is he talking about here? I'm going to tell you that that is... A little bit of a debate with some people. It's not with me, it's not with, with most people that I would know, but there are some people who debate that. They say, well, uh, it's so clearly a prophecy of the crucifixion that some people try to explain away and say, well, it doesn't mean Jesus, it means the nation of Israel. Now, if you read that chapter, you're going to find it doesn't say that it's talking about the nation of Israel. It says that it's talking about an individual, not a nation. And I know that there are folks, and, and certainly not everybody, who, when they read the prophecy of Isaiah, they skip that part and just don't even read it. Why? Because it so clearly points to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and, and they do not want to accept that. So verse 34 again, the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the, the prophet this, of himself? or some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. And that's important to understand. He took that same portion of Isaiah, again, what we would call chapter 53, and he preached unto him Jesus. Philip knew who it was talking about. Philip understand that. Well, where's Philip from? He's, he's an Israelite. He's a Jewish man. And he totally understood that this passage this chapter, as we would call it, was talking about the Messiah, the Savior, the Christ. He understood. And as Philip explained the passage to this man from Ethiopia, apparently the man believed. We'll see that here in just a second. Look at verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came under certain water. Now, we, we were told a little bit ago that they were in a desert place, so water was hard to come by. And they're in Gaza. They're not near the Jordan River. But they came to a place where there was water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Why can't I be baptized? Now, this is very, very important. What happens next? Very essential that we understand this. Verse 37. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And that's, that's an important statement. What is Philip teaching this man from Ethiopia? The man from Ethiopia apparently believed in Jesus. We'll see proof of that in a second. He listened to Philip's explanation of Isaiah 53. He, he put his faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. And now he wants to be baptized. Why not? There's water right there. Why can't I be baptized? And Philip said, there's one thing. If you believe with all your heart, believe what? In baptism? No. If you believe in the Lord Jesus with all your heart, you've trusted him to save you, then you can be baptized. As we read through the book of Acts, starting in chapter 2, we are reading about people being baptized. And in every case, there's not a single exception. The person comes to faith first puts their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, and then they are baptized. It's never the other way around. They're never getting baptized and then coming to trust Jesus. They trust Jesus, and then they're baptized. 
And that's the Bible pattern. That's the Bible way of doing it. And that is why, and I don't mean any disrespect to anybody else, but that is why we don't baptize infants in our church because they haven't put their faith in the Lord Jesus. Well, aren't you concerned about those infants? Well, we're always concerned about infants, but if you mean by that, aren't, aren't I concerned that if they were to pass away while they're babies and they're not baptized, they'll be lost in the land? There's no scripture to support that idea. Now, we, we can talk, and maybe we should another time, about what happens when a, when a baby passes away because that sad event does occur. But for tonight, let me emphasize that baptism always follows faith. And the reason for that is that it is a picture of death, burial, and resurrection. Now, again, I don't mean any disrespect to anyone else, but taking and pouring water upon somebody, whether it's a little water or a lot of water, whether you give them enough for a shower, is not picturing death, burial, and resurrection. It's when the person is taken and immersed in the water. By the way, the word baptized means to place into. It's exactly what it means. So that when the person is put into the water and brought up again, it pictures death, burial, and resurrection. Who's death, burial, and resurrection? Well, first of all, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe in Jesus' death for our sins, his burial, and his resurrection is the guarantee of eternal life. Secondly, we're saying we believe that when we are when we die, Jesus will resurrect us. And thirdly, we're testifying to all who witness our baptism. I am dying to my old way of life. I'm going to start a new life following Jesus. That's what baptism is all about. So here, they came to water, and the man has to be baptized. And Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Notice his answer. 37 again, Philip said, if thou believest all thy heart, thine heart thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, there's nothing wrong with saying, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. There's nothing wrong with that because that's true and that's right. And he did say that, but that's not all he said. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, isn't that the same thing? Well, pretty close. He's saying, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but he says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. As we've said here many times, Christ is not Jesus' last name. He never, when he was on earth, walked into a place of business and somebody said, well, hello, Mr. Christ, how are you doing? Never happened. Never happened. Christ is his title. And it means that he is, in the Hebrew, the Mashiach or the Messiah. In the Greek, the Christos, or the Christ, the Savior, the one who has come to save people from their sin. So what he's saying when he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he's saying, I believe that Jesus is the Savior, and he is the Son of God. And it's all there. It's all there in that statement. So, Phil listens to him and hears this testimony. He asked him about his belief. He testified his belief. And he says this, I believe. He says, I believe in Jesus. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the promised Messiah, the Savior. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is his testimony of his salvation. Now there came a day uh, 40, 48, 49 years ago now when I trusted the Lord Jesus as my Savior. Changed my life entirely. And you know what? This man's life has changed also. And so have countless other people been down through all these centuries. So, verse 38. He, the Ethiopian, commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down, both of them, into the water. Both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now, again, I'm not... I'm not trying to pick on anybody, so please don't think that. But if Philip was just going to pour water on the Ethiopian, there was no reason for them both to get down in the water. But they did. They both got down in the water. And then it says he baptized him, which means he placed him into the water. And if you're not sure about that, look at the next statement, verse 39. And when they were come up out of the water, 
<laughs> so they were down in the water and they came up out of the water. That's what baptism is like. Now at that point, the story takes a dramatic turn. The Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. What does that mean, Philip? <laughs> well, maybe, not necessarily, but it could mean that. What it more likely means is just what we read earlier in the chapter. Philip's in Samaria. The Lord says, go down to Gaza. Gets down to Gaza. The Lord says, go talk to that man. And now he's talking to that man. And the Lord says, okay, and I'll talk to you. And off he goes. What is he doing? He's following the Lord. He's doing what God has called him to do, exactly what we should all do. What about the other man? Well, 39 again, and then when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw no more, and he, a man from Ethiopia, went on his way rejoicing. Where did he go? On his way. Where's that? Back home. And what did he do? Rejoicing all the way. And you suppose when he got back to Ethiopia, he kept his mouth shut about that whole experience? Not likely. Not likely. He probably told anybody and everybody to listen. He may have even told some people he didn't want to listen. <laughs> but he told everybody that he could. What happened to Philip? Well, that's that short story I told you about at the end of the chapter. But Philip was found at Azotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. That's back in Israel. It's actually on the Mediterranean coast. But Philip just went on serving God, just like God told him to do. So the baptism followed belief, um, not the other way around. So it's not belief in baptism. It's not a, a religious ritual just to be followed. But the man believed. He believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I'm going to tell you the truth. I believe that too. The question then becomes to you. Do your friends. Do your family. This man from Ethiopia went home and told his friends and his family and anybody else that listened. Philip went everywhere he would go telling people. And that's what the Lord wants us to do. Go and tell. Let's pray together. Father.